Well, good day, students. Here we are going to work through a single sample t-test. This is our second inferential statistical test that we are learning. The first, of course, was the z-test for means. And as we'll see, there are just a few differences between the z-test and this type of t-test. I'll explain those as we work through this particular example. So our example here is that a drug company is studying the side effects of one of its newest drugs. Now one potential side effect is an increase in body temperature. So the company therefore randomly selects 15 people who have been given the drug and they measure their body temperature under controlled conditions. Now do people in the population have higher body temperatures than the norm? We're doing inferential statistics here. So we want to know something about the population. That is the inference that we're trying to make from our sample to the population. Now the normal body temperature is considered to be 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and here are the 15 temperatures then that we obtain from our sample of individuals. Now let's use an alpha level 05 and we'll work through the steps in NHST just like we've been doing for the, the z-test for means. So here are the populations, the general population, the norm. I have the mean for the norm 98.6. I do not have the standard deviation. So that's one of the differences that we see between the z-test for means and this t-test. With the z-test, I have a sigma given for my comparison population. Here I don't, so I'm going to have to estimate it from my data. Now here's a critical assumption underlying the t-test. The two sigmas are the same for the two populations. The population of people who consume the drug, the population of just the norm. Since these are equal, if I can estimate the standard deviation for the drug group, I can use that as my estimate for the norm population. So our second population then is the, uh, or are the individuals who consume the drug and the mean there is unknown. And again, we're going to estimate the sigma for the drug group and then also for the norm group. So I enter the data into my calculator and I compute the mean and standard deviation for these 15 individuals. So the n is 15, the mean is 98.61 for these 15 people and the standard deviation is 1.30. Make sure you can enter the data into your calculator and obtain these same results. I then write the hypotheses in three value logic form, just like we've been doing for the z-test. The null hypothesis is that the two population means are the same, then the two inequalities, and here is the predicted outcome. Now this isn't hoped for, but they're testing to see does this drug increase body temperature, because it might do so. So this is sort of what they're expecting, but not really hoping for as the drug company. Here is the sampling distribution for the t-test. Now as I mentioned in class, the sampling distribution for the t-test changes its shape depending upon the number of people you have in your study. Now, I'm going to go to the t-test handout here, and if we scroll down, we can see that I discussed this on the handout. As the number of people in your sample increases, then the sampling process changes. You either have 15 people in the sampling process, 20 people, 100 people, and so forth. And based on that, the sampling distribution changes its shape. Now what it does, it becomes more and more normal. It starts out a little bit platycurtic with small sample sizes, let's say five, 10 people. But then as you increase the number of people in the sampling process, it will approach a nice normal curve. But since it changes its shape, depending upon your sample size, you have potentially an infinite number of different T distributions. So we have to basically jump right into, or jump into the right distribution. And the way we do that is just use what's known as the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom for this t-test is n minus one, and that will allow us then to jump into the right distribution so we can get our t-critical values. So with n minus one, we had 15 people, the degrees of freedom are 14. So now we go to the t-table and we scan down Alpha 05 here, we're always running two-tailed tests and we're looking for 14 degrees of freedom. And here we see it, 2.145. I don't know if I can highlight this or not, eh, kind of. Okay, so 2.145, I can't highlight it. There we go, 2.145 is the cut point, or the critical value for our rejection region. So let's go back then. And so you can see here, I have it plus or minus 2.145. So there's the negative side, there's the positive side. The T distribution is centered at zero and so now we have our rejection region set up. So now we can plug and chug through and get T observed to see if we have a statistically significant result. So here are the computations for the formula. So 98.61 minus the normed mean 98.6. There's our standard deviation. There's the sample size. 
plug and chug through and you get 0 0.03, a pretty tiny little value. And we see here that it is close to zero. It's not even close to the rejection region. So we fail to reject the null. So we fail to reject null. That means the result is not statistically significant. And our conclusion then is the mu drug is equal to the mu norm. So in the population, we don't think that the mean body temperature for those who consume the drug is any different than the norm. We can write that up. It appears that contrary to expectation, the population mean body temperature for those taking the drug is equal to the norm mean body temperature. In other words, it appears the drug does not lead to a population increase in the mean body temperature. So this is again good news actually for the drug company. We can now go and get P observed for our T value. Now we can't use the Z table here because we're not working with a perfect normal distribution. The distribution we're in with only 14 degrees of freedom is a little bit platycurtic compared to a normal curve. So we need to use some kind of online calculator that will work for that particular distribution. So here is one such calculator. You can copy and paste this into your web browser and I'm going to go to that website now and show you how the calculator works. So this is a very simple calculator. You see your degrees of freedom, your t-value, then you can get the, the probability. So we had 14 degrees of freedom and our t-value was a measly 0 0.03 and then we compute that well, I put a comma in there. Let's put a point in there, Heather. And try that again. There we go. So the probability is 0.4882. And that is a one-tailed probability. So it's only on one tail of the distribution. Remember, in this class, we always look on both sides. We're going to have to double that, just like we did for the z-test. So let's go back to the PowerPoint presentation. And let's double that value. So 0.4882 times 2, we get 0.9764. So that is our p obs. Clearly much greater than 0.05. This would be a disaster if you hope for statistical significance because clearly we're closer to 1 than we are to 0.05. But again, the drug company, this is good news for them. They, they really didn't want the drug to increase body temperature. So now we go to the effect size. We'll just go ahead and use little d, Cohen's d. We plug and chug through, and uh, there's our standard deviation. Again, we get 0 0.01. And this is a near zero effect and would be minuscule using Cohen's conventions. Even without Cohen's conventions, we see this is a Z value. It's not from a normal curve, but it's a, it's a Z statistic. And we can see it is tiny, close to zero. So the drug, if it is elevating body temperature, it's by a, mini, a minuscule amount. Lastly then, we go to the confidence interval. So here's the form of the confidence interval. We're building it around the mu for the drug. It's a 95% confidence interval. Here's the formula for it. And we start plugging and chugging. There's our obtained mean, 98.61, plus or minus the 0.73. Now what I did to get the 0.73 is here's our t-critical value times 0.34. That gives you 0.73. Then finally do the addition and subtraction here, and you get 97.88 up to 99.34. Now if we compare that to the that spread of about 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit to the standard deviation, 1.3, is about middling precision because those are about the same uh, value. So this is the one slight caveat with the study that's not a highly precise estimate of the population mean, but we only had 15 people, so that's really not all that surprising. You don't have to write these kind of summaries here, but just to summarize what we did, uh, overall the drug company would not worry about this potential side effect given the results. We have a non-significant finding. It appears that contrary to expectation, the drug does not increase the body temperature in the population, the population mean anyway. Standardized effect was only 0.03. Actually, that should be 0.01. So it's just a tiny little effect there. And the confidence interval indicates middling precision in estimating the body temperature for those consuming the drug. Also, just as another reminder here, we understand that the right way to interpret the confidence interval is to say, I'm 95% confident that this interval here includes the true mean. I'm never going to say I'm 95% confident the population mean falls in the interval. The idea is that the interval moves around, not the mean. Again, you don't have to put these things in your notes or write these up as a summary. This is just sort of a summary that I'm giving you here to go over uh, what we've done, kind of give you the big picture of how we would interpret these results.